So, Ruhe bitte, Achtung, Achtung, as we Germans say. <laughs> um, so now I come to the solution. Before I explained the problems, now I hope to explain at least the outlines of the solution to the problem. Um, and I call this solution the idea of a private law society. Um, so if the state, and especially the democratic state, is demonstrably incapable of creating and maintaining social order, um, if instead of helping to avoid conflict, the state is a source of permanent conflict. Um, and if, rather than assuring legal security and predictability, the state itself continuously generates insecurity and unpredictability through its legislation, and if the state replaces constant law with flexible and arbitrary whim, uh, then escapably, of course, the question uh, arises as to the correct, and that must be uh, necessarily non-statist solution to the problem of social order. How do we enforce these rules that I explained at the beginning as efficiently as is humanly possible? And the solution to this is what I call a private law society. Uh, and a private law society is a society in which every individual and every institution is subject to one and the same set of laws. There is no public law that grants privileges to specific persons or to specific functions. And there is also no public property in such a society. There is in such a society only private law and private property equally applicable to each and everyone. No one is permitted to acquire property by any means other than through original appropriation, through production, or through voluntary exchange. And no one possesses a privilege to tax or to expropriate. And moreover, in a private law society, no one is permitted to prohibit anyone else from using his own property in order to enter any line of production that he wishes to enter and compete against whomever he wants to compete. Now, specifically regarding the problem that we want to discuss here, that is, um, in a private law society, the production of security, the production of law and order, will also be undertaken by freely financed individuals and agencies that compete for a voluntarily paying or not paying clientele, just as a production of all other goods and services. Now, it would be presumptuous wanting to predict the precise shape and form of the security industry that would emerge within the framework of a private law society. But it is not at all difficult to predict a few central changes um, that would fundamentally and very favorably distinguish a competitive security industry from the present and all too well known statist production of injustice and disorder. First off, while in any complex society that is based on the division of labor, self defense will play only a secondary role for reasons that I will come back to in a few minutes, um, it should be emphasized from the outset that in a private law society, everyone's right to defend oneself from aggression against one's person 
and against one's property is entirely undisputed. In distinct contrast to the present statist practice, which renders people increasingly unarmed and defenseless against aggressors, in a private law society, no restrictions on the private ownership of firearms and other weapons exists. Everyone's elementary right to engage in self-defense to protect his life and property against invaders will be sacrosanct. And as one knows from the experience of the not so wild, wild West, as well as numerous recent empirical investigations into the relationship between the frequency of gun ownership and crime rates, more guns imply less crime. Let me just say a few words about this because people are very confused about this. First, in the Wild West, that is in the time in the United States when the federal state did not really exist and practically every person was owning guns, contrary to what you see in many Wild West films. Um, there existed very small amounts of crime as com per capita crime as compared to what exists in the current United States. Imagine that you try to rob a bank and every bank employee has a gun. Um, the likelihood that you will get out of this gun is practically zero. These sorts of things did simply not happen. These areas were relatively wild, but wild only in the sense that people were willing participants in, uh, in brawls. So if you did go to a bar um, and got into a fight, and then people went outside and sh uh, were shooting it out, that is obviously not crime. Uh, we would not interfere if Mike Tyson is boxing against Muhammad Ali, that they are beating each other up. These are willing participants in something like this. Those sorts of things existed in the Wild West, no question about it. But if you abstain from these types of things, the Wild West was an extremely safe place as compared with the present United States, which is a dangerous place, especially in major cities, due to the fact that increasingly more limitations were put on gun ownership, uh, whereas, of course, criminals do not care about uh, breaking the law. After all, that's why they are criminals. Um, imagine what would have happened if they would not have disarmed the entire British population in recent decades during the riots that you saw recently taking place in London. Do you think that the riots would have been as successful in terms of the damage that they would have caused if the British population would have been armed? I doubt it very much. If you look at countries um, that are heavily armed, such as Switzerland, where every male adult has an assault rifle in his, cab in his private cabinet with ammunition. Switzerland is one of the lowest crime rate countries in the world and is one of the most heavily armed countries in the world. The same applies also to uh, Israel, as far as I know. I'm not as familiar with the Israeli case as I am with the, uh, with the Swiss case. Um, and uh, uh, there's a, f a famous uh, study with the title uh, More Guns, uh, Less Crime by a guy John Lott th that gives ample uh, illustration of the fact that the easier it is in various states to have concealed weapons, the lower the crime rate tends to be. If, um, I mean, just think of something like this. Um, there, there was a rivalry between two different towns in the United States. In one, in one town, they outlawed any, any ownership of guns entirely, and the rival town uh, 
prescribed that people had to own guns. Um, no, uh, criminals are not nice guys, but they are not dumb. Um, <laughs> so in what, in, in what town would you just uh, uh, build up your operation? Uh, that seems to be rather obvious. Um, th th this experiment was then basically outlawed by the federal government saying, it's all right what that one town did outlawing uh, guns, but it is not all right what the other town did prescribing everybody to, uh, to own guns. In any case, um, but just as in today's complex economy, of course, we do not produce our own shoes and our own suits and our own telephones, um, but we take advantage of uh, the advantages that division of labor uh, offers. So we can expect that we will also do so when it comes to the production of security, especially the more property a person owns and the richer a society as a whole is. Um, hence, most security services will without doubt be provided by specialized agencies that compete with each other for voluntarily paying clients by various private police, insurance, and arbitration agencies. Now, if I wanted to summarize in one word the decisive difference and the decisive advantage of a competitive security industry as compared to the current status practice, this word would be contract. The state, as the ultimate decision maker and judge, operates in a contractless legal vacuum. There exists no contract between the state and its citizens. We do not have a contract that says, I will do such and such under such and such circumstances. It is not contractually fixed what is actually owned by whom and what, accordingly, is to be protected. The state does not say, you own your income. No, it says, you make an income and I tell you how much you can keep and how much I will take. Um, it is not fixed what service the state is to provide. It is not fixed what is to happen if the state fails in its duty, nor what the price is that the, custom, the customer, so to speak, of the service that the state uh, offers must pay for this service. Tax rates are flexible. They don't say tax is this and never will be changed. They never ask us if they change it, if that is okay. No, none of these things are fixed. Rather, the state unilaterally fixes the rules of the game, the laws, and can change them by legislation during the game. Um, obviously, such a behavior is inconceivable for freely financed security providers. Imagine this. Just imagine a private security provider, regardless whether it's a police, an insurer, or an arbitrator, whose offer consisted in something like this. He would say, I will not contractually guarantee you anything. I will not tell you what specific things I will regard as your to be protected property. Nor will I tell you what I oblige myself to do if, according to your opinion, I do not fulfill my service to you. But in any case, I reserve the right to unilaterally determine the price that you must pay me for such undefined service. Now, now any, any such security provider would, be, would immediately disappear from the market due, com to, due to a complete lack of demand from the side of customers. Each private, freely financed security producer instead must offer its protective clients a contract, first of all. And these contracts must, in order to be acceptable or to appear acceptable, 
by voluntarily paying clients contain clear property descriptions as well as clearly defined mutual services and obligations. Moreover, each party to a contract for the duration and until the fulfillment of the contract would be bound by its terms and conditions and every change of the terms and conditions would require the unanimous consent of all parties concerned. So again, the state, again, let me just emphasize, the state can, of course, just pass different laws as if you are just in, in, a, in, a, in a football game, in the middle of the football game, uh, the, the penalty rules will be changed. Um, in, in, instead of just agreeing on that, from the, from the outset or insisting, of course we can change it in the middle of the game, but only if we both agree on in which way they should be changed. Now more specifically, in order to appear acceptable to security buyers, these contracts must contain provisions about what will be done in the case of a conflict or dispute between the alleged protector or insurer and his own protected or insured clients, that is, if there is a client between the insurance company and the, uh, the insurance company and the client of this company, nobody would sign a contract unless there would be some ruling what will happen in such a case. Um, and these contracts must also contain provisions. Uh, what will happen in the case of a conflict between different protecting agencies or different insurers and their respective clients. Everybody knows there can be also conflicts between different insurers. What will we do if there is a conflict between this insurer and that insurer? And each insurer will have to have provisions in its contract what procedure will be put in motion if that case arises, because everyone knows that case, of course, can arise also. And in this regard, only one mutually agreeable solution exists. In these cases, that is, where we have conflicts between the clients of the company and the company itself, or we have conflicts between different companies, um, the only solution that exists is that one then resorts to arbitration by independent third parties. Emphasis on independent third parties. Um, and these independent third parties that are then used as arbitrators in cases of conflict between someone is insured and the insurance company or different insurance companies, these independent um, third parties must be parties that are trusted by both parties to the conflict. Um, and in addition, um, these third parties are also freely financed arbitration agencies that again stand in competition with each other, with other arbitration agencies. The clients, that is, the insurers and the insured, uh, expect of these arbitrators, of these independent third parties, that they will come up with a verdict that is recognized as fair and just by all sides and only arbitrators that are capable of forming such judgments will succeed in the arbitration market because no arbitration agency can rely on the fact that it will be chosen in the next arbitration case again. You can turn to different companies if either of the conflicting parties is dissatisfied with the service performed by these arbitration agencies. Arbitrators that are incapable of forming judgments that are considered to be fair by all conflicting uh, clients, uh, and they are, which are viewed as biased or partial, will simply disappear from the market. I'll come back to, to this topic at, a little bit later again. 
Now, from, from this fundamental advantage that is that there, are, that there exists a contractual relationship between uh, agencies that allegedly protect you and you who wants to be protected, uh, a number of additional advantages follow. First off, uh, competition among police and among insurers and arbitrators for paying clients would bring about a tendency toward a continuous fall in the price of protection per insured value, um, which makes protection increasingly more affordable, also for poor people, so to speak, whereas under monopolistic conditions, the price of protection will steadily rise and become increasingly unaffordable. I mean, what we pay for protection currently goes up every year. Uh, on the other hand, the protection that we are actually receiving gets worse and worse by ye from year to year. Um, furthermore, as I have already indicated, protection and security are goods and services that compete with all other goods and services. Um, if more resources are allocated to protection, uh, fewer resources can be expended on cars, on vacation, on food and drink, for, for example. Um, and also, uh, resources that are allocated to the protection of person A or group A, um, let's say people living on, uh, on the west coast of Australia, uh, compete with uh, resources uh, expended on the protection of people B living on the east coast of, uh, of Australia. Um, and as a tax-funded protection monopolist, the state's allocation of resources will be necessarily arbitrary. Why do they spend more on this uh, group than on that group? How much should be spent in total on protection? Uh, conceivably, you can uh, protect people by equipping everyone with, uh, with a personal bodyguard and a, a tank and a flamethrower put on, on, on top of it. Um, do we need that much protection? Or would be one policeman per thousand people with a stick be sufficient? How do we, de how we, do we decide these sorts of things? The market decides these sorts of things, how much milk we reproduce, who wants to have how much milk, where will the milk be delivered. Um, when it comes to states deciding how much to provide of what, to whom, they have, they have no rational way to decide because consumers do not buy these things. They make the decision for consumers of whose desires and needs they have not the faintest idea. Um, as a tax-funded protection monopolist, the state's allocation of resources is always arbitrary. Um, there will be overproduction or there will be underproduction of security as compared to other competing goods and services. And there will be overprotection of some individuals, groups, or regions, and underprotection of others. Of course, most of the protection will be for the state officials themselves. Uh, they always make sure that they have plenty of bodyguards surrounding them, even though they should be the ones that deserve to be unprotected. So in, in, in sharp contrast to that, in a, in a system of freely competing protection agencies, all arbitrariness of allocation, all over and under production would disappear. Protection would be accorded the relative importance that it has in the eyes of voluntary paying consumers. And it should be perfectly clear that people have very different demands in this. I mean, if you are Arnold Schwarzenegger, you don't need as many personal bodyguards as I need as a <laughs> relatively weak person, so to speak. Um, some old ladies might want to have more protection than, uh, than some strong young men. If you live in a uh, 
high crime rate cities, you expend more money on that than if you live uh, in the in the outbacks uh, uh, somewhere and uh, um, and like Croco Crocodile Dundee have n know how to handle uh, knives and weapons in the perfect uh, perfect way. So protection would be accorded the importance that it has for different people at different places. And no person or group or region would uh, receive protection at the expense of any other one. Each and every one would receive protect protection in accordance with his own payments, and the payments in accordance with his own desires. But the most important advantage of a private contract-based production of law and order, however, is of a qualitative nature. First, there is a uh, fight against crime. The state is notoriously inefficient in this regard because the state agents entrusted with this task are paid out of taxes. That is, they are independent of their uh, Payment is independent of their productivity. Why should you work if you are paid for doing nothing at all? Um, in fact, it can be expected that state agents take an interest in maintaining a moderately high crime rate because this way you can justify ever increased funding. Um, as a matter of fact, we know, of course, that, that the police employs all sorts of agents that act as agents provocateurs. Um, that is, that cause certain problems, and then afterwards just say, hey, we need more funding in order to protect ourselves against these types of activities. Again, to give you an example from, from Germany, they are thinking about, again, out, outlawing some right-wing so-called Nazi party. The problem with that is, is this, uh, they tried that a few years ago and then they found out that most of the provocative actions based on which they wanted to outlaw that party were done by agents of the state that had been infiltrating this party. Um, and and then, then even the courts were too ashamed to just outlaw the party because the people, the people had been state employees who had been responsible for these types of activities. In fact, what we can expect is that state agents take, as I said, um, and even worse is for state agents, the victims of crime and the indemnification, the compensation uh, of such victims plays at best a very negligible role. The state does not indemnify the victims of crime. The state claims that it protects us from crime, uh, from murderers, uh, robbers, and, and so forth. But if it fails in that task, they don't do anything to just make good um, to the contrary, the harmed victims are still further insulted in making them, as taxpayers, pay for the incarceration and the rehabilitation of the criminal should he be captured. Um, the victims do not get anything from the aggressors. No, the aggressors are incarcerated. The incarceration of an American, a prisoner in America is for roughly $70,000 per year. Um, so these people can just play table tennis, complain if they don't get the right muesli for breakfast. Uh, uh, they can work out so that once they get back out, uh, they are next time a little bit stronger. Um, they, can even st they can even study law. Uh, in order to bring lawsuits against people who, uh, against the people who have in, in, incarcerated, uh, incarcerated them. Um, there is no incentive, for instance, for the state police 
to find stolen goods. Ask yourself, is there incentive for an insurance company to find stolen goods? The answer is, of course, if I find the goods, I don't have to compensate them. Why should a policeman ever try to find stolen goods? Uh, it makes no, dif makes no difference whatsoever. Um, uh, private companies would have an incentive to prevent crimes, because if they prevent crimes, they don't have to pay up. Um, why would a state-funded policeman have an interest in preventing crimes uh, if they have no obligation to do any compensation afterwards? In that case, they rather hand out parking tickets, uh, drink coffee at 7-Eleven, uh, and uh, instead of engaging in dangerous things like hunting down dangerous criminals, uh, yeah, uh, they, en they enjoy life by doing things that are pleasurable because everybody pre prefers, of course, to do pleasurable things uh, over doing dangerous, dangerous things. Um, private security providers, in particular insurers, as I said, because they have to indemnify their clients in the case of an actual damage, otherwise they would, of course, find no client whatsoever, um, they must operate in an efficient manner. They must be efficient in the prevention of crime, because otherwise they would have to pay up. Um, if a criminal act cannot be pre prevented, they must be efficient in detecting and recovering the stolen loot, otherwise, again, they would have to pay up, and particular they must be efficient in the detection and in the apprehension of the criminal, for only if the criminal is apprehended is it possible for them to make him pay for the compensation owed to the victim and thereby reduce their own cost. So all very, very different. Simply the incentive structure is an entirely different one than the incentive structure that is faced by tax-funded protection agencies. In addition, a private competitive and contract-based security industry has a general peace-promoting effect. Now, states are, as I have indirectly already explained, by nature aggressive institutions. They can cause and provoke conflict in order to then solve it to their own advantage. Or to put it differently, um, as tax-funded monopolists of ultimate decision-making, states can externalize the cost associated with aggressive behavior onto other people, that is, onto the hapless taxpayers, and accordingly will tend to be more aggressive vis-a-vis -vis their own population as well as vis-a-vis -vis foreigners. Uh, a, simple, a simple riddle. Um, would the United States have gone to war against Iraq if Bush and his cronies had to pay all the costs associated with it out of their own pocket? Um, the answer should be clear as daylight. If you can make other people pay for your own ridiculous aggressive policies, hey, you tend to be more aggressive than you normally would be. Um, so again, competing private insurers are by nature, however, defensive and peaceful. On the one hand, this is because every act of aggression is costly. And an insurance company that would engage in aggressive conduct would require comparatively higher insurance premiums. Uh, and that involves a loss of clients to cheaper, non-aggressive insurers. And on the other hand, it is not possible to insure oneself against every conceivable risk. Rather, it is only possible to insure oneself against accidents, that is, risks over whose outcome you have no personal control. Um, and to which you do not contribute anything. 
to give, for, for example, it is possible to insure yourself against the risk of death and the risk of fire. Um, but it is impossible to insure oneself against the risk of committing suicide tomorrow um, or to burn down your own house. Um, Similar, it is impossible to insure oneself against the risk of business failure. Um, if you could do this, I would insure myself, and uh, then the next day I just mess up my business, and then I could collect the insurance premium. You cannot insure yourself against such things like this. You cannot also insure yourself against unemployment. I mean, there is something, of course, that's called unemployment insurance. But, but again, states invent, of course, uh, America defends America by attacking Iraq, even though no Iraqi ever attacked the United States. This is a completely defensive activity. Uh, so we, of course, also have unemployment insurance. Um, but unemployment is an, an uninsurable risk. All I have to do to get unemployed is go to my boss and tell him what SOB he is, and then I, then I lose my job, and, I, and the insurance company would be held responsible to help me out in this problem. Um, <coughs> it's also impossible to insure myself against disliking my neighbor. Um, for in each case, one has some control or full control over the event in question, the risk in question. Most significantly, the uninsurability of individual actions and sentiments in distinction to the insurability against accidents implies that it is also impossible to insure oneself against the risk of damages that result from one's own prior aggression or provocation. That is, I cannot insure myself against me going out and provoking somebody else or hitting him in the head and then saying, hey, now this guy is retaliating against me, come to my rescue. No insurance company would ever take on cases like, like this. Um, instead, every insurer must restrict the actions of his clients so as to exclude all aggressions and provocation on their part. Otherwise, they will simply not insure you. Uh, that is, any insurance against social disasters such as crime must be contingent on the insured submitting themselves to specified norms of civilized, non-aggressive conduct. And further, due to the same reasons and financial concerns, insurers will tend to require that their clients abstain from all forms of vigilante justice, except in quite extraordinary circumstances, because Vigilante justice, even if it is justified, invariably causes uncertainty and provokes possible third-party intervention. And by obliging their clients instead to submit to regular and publicized and open procedures whenever they think that they have been victimized, these disturbances uh, that are associated and the associated cost with these disturbances can be largely avoided. So vigilante justice will not take place. The insurance companies will say, except in, under very circum unusual circumstances, there has to be an open investigation. Everything must be public so that uh, conflicts, sudden involvements of third parties, uh, can be reduced so that the cost of the operation of the insurance business can be, uh, can be lowered. Um, and by obliging their clients instead to submit to regular and publicized procedures whenever they think that they have been victimized, these disturbances and associated costs can be largely avoided. And lastly, it is worthwhile pointing out that while states as tax-funded agencies can and do engage in large-scale prosecution of victimless crimes such as illegal drug use, prostitution, and gambling, these so-called crimes would tend to be of little or no concern within a system of freely funded protection agencies. Um, protection against such crimes 
would require obviously higher insurance premiums. But since these crimes, unlike genuine crimes, where you have really victims, uh, are crimes where you don't have any victims, uh, would simply not find any clients. Why should I just uh, pay higher insurance premiums uh, to protect myself against something that, that never victimizes me in, uh, in, any, uh, in any way? And even more, while states, as I have already noticed, are always and everywhere eager to disarm its population and thus rob it of an essential means of self-defense, private law societies are characterized by an unrestricted right to self-defense and hence by widespread private gun and weapon ownership. Just, again, just imagine a security producer who demanded of its prospective clients that they would first have to completely disarm themselves, hand over all weapons, all knives, all hammers, all saws, and whatever it is, before this company would be willing to defend the client's life and property. Now, correctly, everybody would think of this as a bad joke and refuse such an offer. So, so the company comes to you and says, I will protect you, but first you hand over everything that you can use to protect yourself first, and then my protection will begin. Now, every normal person will say, oh, there is something really fishy going on here. <laughs> um, no, nonetheless, this is precisely what the states do, obviously. Now, freely financed insurance companies that demanded potential clients first to hand over all of their means of self-defense as a prerequisite of protection would immediately arouse the most utmost as suspicion uh, as to their true motives, and they would quickly go bankrupt. In their own best interest, insurance companies, on the other hand, would reward armed clients, in particular those that are able to certify some level of training in the handling of arms and charging them lower premiums that reflect the lower risk that they represent. In the same way as insurers charge less if homeowners have an alarm system or a safe installed, so would a trained gun owner represent a lower insurance risk. Now, last and most importantly, a system of competing protection agencies would have a twofold impact on the development of law. On the one hand, it would allow for a greater variability of law. Let me explain this first. Instead of imposing a uniform set, uh, uniform set of standards onto everyone, as that is the case under status condition, protection agencies could compete against each other not just by price, but also through protect product differentiation. There could exist, for instance, side by side, Catholic protection agencies or insurers applying canon law, Jewish agencies applying Mosaic law, Muslim agencies applying Islamic law, and agencies applying secular law of one variety or another, all of them sustained by a voluntarily paying cli clientele. Consumers could choose, so to speak, the law applied to them and their property, and no one would have to live under a foreign law. Now, on the other hand, the very same system of private law order and uh, private production of law and order would promote a tendency toward the unification and the harmonization of law. Because the domestic, so to speak, domestic, Catholic, Jewish, Roman, uh, Mosaic law, whatever, um, would apply obviously only to the person and property of those who had chosen this law. Um, canon law, for instance, would apply only to professed Catholics and deal solely with intra-Catholic conflict and conflict resolution. That is, with conflict resolution between two, two Catholics that are uh, voluntarily, have voluntarily subject themselves to this 
canon law. Um, yet it is obviously also possible, of course, that a Catholic might come into conflict with a subscriber of some other law code, such a Muslim law code, for instance. Now, if both law codes reach the same or a similar conclusion, then of course no difficulties would arise. However, if competing law codes arrived at distinctly different conclusions, and they would definitely do so in some cases, then obviously a problem arises. That is, the domestic, the intra-group law would be obviously useless, but naturally every insured person would want protection also against this contingency, namely the contingency of intergroup conflicts. Everyone knows that can of course happen also. Uh, might be nice if, they, or if you are all Catholics, then the problem would be very simple to be solved, but if we are not all Catholics, everybody knows then a conflict can arise between that group and that group, and they sometimes come to different, uh, different conclusions. Um, so in this situation, it cannot be expected that one insurer or the and the subscribers of its law code simply subordinate their judgment to that of another insurer and its law. Rather, as I have already explained before, um, in this situation, there exists only one credible and acceptable way out of this predicament. And that is, from the outset, every insurer would have to be contractually obliged to submit itself and its client to arbitration by an independent third party. And this party would not only be independent, but at the same time, it would be the unanimous choice of both conflicting parties. So the Catholic agency and the Muslim agency would go to a third independent, unanimously agreed upon uh, agency that determines now the conflict that they have regarding who is right and who is wrong in the case at hand. And it would be agreed upon the third party because of its commonly perceived ability to find mutually agreeable fair solution in cases of intergroup disagreements. And if an arbitrator failed in this task and arrived at conclusions that were perceived as unfair or biased by either one of the insurers or their clients, this person or this agency would not likely be chosen as an arbitrator in the future again. And as a result then of this constant cooperation of various insurers and arbitrators, a tendency toward the unification of property and contract law and the harmonization of the rules of procedure, evidence, and conflict resolution would be set in motion. So again, it's important to realize that the vari a variety of law codes does not at all exclude a development towards, toward a harmonization of laws as soon as it comes to conflicts between these rival law codes, quite to the contrary, there is a pressure to then develop universal law codes that apply, so to speak, to all these different law codes that are applied to, in, to uh, uh, internal groups. Uh, so a tendency towards the unification of property and contract law and the harmonization of the rules of procedure, evidence, conflict resolution would be set in motion. So in, in buying protection insurance, every insurer and every insured becomes a participant in an integrated system of conflict avoidance uh, and of peacekeeping. Every single conflict and every single damage claim, regardless of where and by or against whom would fall exactly in the jurisdiction of one or more specific insurance agency and would be handled either by an individual insurer's domestic law or by the international or universal law provisions and procedures agreed upon by everyone in advance by agreeing on third party arbitration. And so as a result, instead of permanent conflict and 
injustice and legal insecurity as we have it under the present status conditions in a private law society we would get the highest degree of peace justice legal security um, and uh, and safe and uh, and safety thank you very much Um, can I ask a, a question which I guess is appropriate for the time? Um, in, in Europe we're seeing the, the nations having problems with their, their levels of debt and um, issue of bonds and we're seeing this uh, occurring uh, in the United States and probably in most parts of the world. Um, as we move on to the next stage in, in society, uh, are we more likely to go your way or more likely to go to a t totalitarian state? If you, yeah, if you ask me, I'm, uh, I rather tend to be pessimistic. I think we, uh, the situation has become worse from, from year to year as, as far as I'm concerned. Um, I'm pretty sure that there will be a catastrophe brewing somewhere in the future, but catastrophes do not always end up uh, improving things. They might, things, might make things even, even worse. Uh, the European crisis, for instance, has not led to a situation where the European Union is as broken up as it should be, um, but uh, has led to a situation where increased attempts are being made to, uh, uh, to go further in, in terms of centralization, to create European central governments and so forth. Um, so in the short run, I tend to be rather pessimistic. Um, uh, if I would be at a fundraising dinner, I would have to say there must be something good in the future coming, so <laughs> that you get that you get that you get some return on your money. Um, I'm I'm not too hopeful for mankind. Um, on, on, on the on the on the other hand, uh, as as long as they don't incarcerate us and leave us alone, let's try to have as much fun as possible. And. Uh, uh, and, and, and enjoy simply that we have insights that other people do not have. I mean, just have to see, see the nonsense going on and just sit there and say, didn't I say that that would happen? Exactly, <laughs> it happened.